This R tutorial is an introduction to species distribution modeling. And species distribution models attempt to model where a species is expected to occur, either now in places where we haven't looked to see if it's there, or in the future, uh, contingent upon changes in the environment. And these models can be based on lots of different factors, but often it's just environmental ones due to the availability of the kinds of data that we need. And this demo will build a simple version of this kind of model using a generalized linear model uh, and two environmental predictors. And this isn't sufficient for doing the kinds of work uh, that we would do for species distribution modeling more generally. Don't run out and publish any papers with it, but it's a great way to understand what's going on as we build and evaluate species distribution models. Let's start by loading some packages, and in fact, even before then, make sure that you have all of the data that you need. Instructions for this are on the materials page, but you should have downloaded a zip file and uh, extracted it to get access to these data, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then we want to load some packages, and the first package, the first package that we're going to load is the Dismo package. This is one of the big species distribution modeling packages, and we're going to use it for uh, conducting evaluation on the model that we build. We'll see that this is going to go ahead and load two of the spatial packages as well, and so those have already been loaded, and we can use their functions as well. Uh, and then we'll also load uh, the dplyr package to let us do a little bit of data manipulation that we need to do today. And we'll load the ggplot package uh, to let us make one graph that would be a little uh, more difficult to make otherwise. That's ggplot2. So I mentioned this data over here. Uh, we need two kinds of data for building species distribution models. The first is information on where the species that we're interested in occurs. And so that's data on both where the species is present and ideally also where the species is absent. We don't always have absence data, uh, in which case we make fake absence data called background or pseudo absences. Uh, but we're going to ignore that today and use data that has real absences associated with it. We then also need spatial data for the factors that are influencing our species distribution. Most commonly, uh, we see the use of variables related to temperature and precipitation. But that's mostly based on what data is conveniently available, not really the underlying biology for species. And so something important to keep in mind is that we want to use predictor variables that are as close as possible to the ones uh, that are influencing where the species of interest occurs. However, that kind of data can be hard to come by because if we're using species distribution models for forecasting, like we are in this class, we need not only the current values of our predictor variables, but also the future values. And so we need forecasts for our predictor variables in order to make forecasts for species distributions. But for many of the variables that we think of as being directly associated with species distributions, we don't have forecasts for those variables in the future. For our data on species presence and absence, we're going to use data from the North American Breeding Bird Survey data set for the hooded warbler. Uh, and that's uh, in this hoodedwarblocations.csv file. And we can go ahead and load that in using read.csv. So we'll call this 
hooded warb data is equal to read.csv and then the name of that file. So hooded warb locations.csv. And if we look at this data, we'll see that we have three pieces of information. The longitude and the latitude, which tell us where the survey was conducted to see if this species was there. And then a column called present, which has a one in it if the species was present, and a zero if the species was not present. For the environmental data, uh, we're going to use data on minimum temperature and annual precipitation. And for the current data, uh, the data that's associated with the surveys that we made, that's from the WorldClim data set. And for the forecast data, uh, that's going to be from the uh, CMIP5 50-year forecast, so for about 50 years into the future from now. And CMIP stands for Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, which is basically the place to go to get these really long-term climate forecasts for the future. Those data are stored in uh, raster data files. Uh, one is ENV current for our current data and the forecasted values are in ENV forecast. We can load those uh, using the stack command from the raster package. Now the raster package has been loaded already by loading Dismo. And we're going to use the stack command because these are actually raster stacks because they have one layer for minimum temperature and one layer for precipitation. So let's go ahead and load those. And so we'll call this env data current. And that's going to be loaded using the stack function quotes. And then we just need the name of the GRD file. These two files are, are tied to one another, and this will load the information from both. And then we'll also load env data forecast, again using the stack function, but now uh, the forecast.grd file. And we can take a quick look at what's in these environmental data sets by running plot on ENV data, and we'll look at the current data. Uh, since there are two layers in here, we can pick one uh, to plot by using dollar sign and then the name of that variable. And so we can do dollar sign t min here. And this will give us a uh, raster map that shows that this is uh, a global product. It's got uh, t-min values for all over the world. And that's what we'll use for our temperature data. There's another layer in here called precip. Uh, that we'll also use. The first thing we need to do is combine the data so that we can get out the information about which environments a species occurs in and which environments it doesn't occur in. So we can look at its distribution in environmental space. To do this, we need to put the two data sets together, our climate data and our location data. And we start to do this uh, by selecting just the location columns from our hooded warbler data, because that's what we need to extract the information. And so we'll say hooded warb locations is equal to, and I'm going to use select from dplyr. You can use something else to select these columns. Uh, and I'll select from the hooded warb data, the longitude column and the latitude column. And the order here is important. We need to select the X column first, 
and the y column second, so that the first column is the x's, which is longitude, and the second column is the y's. And now we're going to use the extract function from the raster package to get us the environmental data at each of these locations where we've surveyed for hooded warblers. And so we'll call this hooded warb env for environment. And the extract function, which takes two arguments. First is the environmental data the raster that we want to extract information from. And so that's env data current, because we want to get the current data to build our model. And then the locations where we want to extract that data. And so that's our hooded warb locations. And if we run this, we'll get out a data frame that has the uh, environmental data at each of those locations. Which we can see here. So we've got environments for minimum temperature and precipitation. And these are in the same order as the values uh, in hooded warb data. And so we just need to attach them together so that we can work with the environmental data and the presence data at the same time. Uh, and we can do that using cbind for column bind. And so we'll say hooded warb data. So we're going to overwrite our hooded warb data with uh, that data plus some environmental data. And we can do that by saying bind together as columns our current hooded warb data and our new hooded warb environmental data. And so now if we look at hooded warb data, we'll see we've got longitude, latitude, information on presence or absence, and then the associated environmental conditions. You'll notice that our temperatures uh, look unrealistic. Uh, that's just because they've had their units changed uh, to store them more efficiently in rasters. So if we wanted actual temperatures, uh, we would just divide by 10 here uh, and we'd have temperatures in degrees C. So now that we've done this, we can get our first look at where our species is located in environmental space. And we're going to do this using ggplot. The first argument is the data we want to plot, and so that's hooded warb data. We then need to set a mapping, which is equal to AES, the aesthetic function. And then on the X, we'll plot one of our environmental variables. We'll say T min. On Y, we'll plot the other environmental variable, precip. And then we'll color our points based on that present column. So one for present, two for uh, zero for absent. And then we'll plot this uh, as uh, a scatter plot using geome point. And if we look at this graph, uh, we can see a couple of things. First, all of these points together show us all of the environmental conditions that were sampled uh, as part of these surveys. So we've got a large range of temperatures and a large range of precipitations. The dark points are our absence values. And so these are areas of environmental space where the species doesn't occur. And uh, the light colored points are presence values and so they show us where the species does occur. And in general, uh, we can see that this species likes higher temperatures and precipitation values. And so what we want our species distribution model to do is find these regions of climate space in a quantitative way where the species is most likely to occur.
So let's build a species distribution model. There are many different ways to model the probability of species presences. Uh, we're going to look at one of the simplest uh, that we can readily understand today, which will be a generalized linear modeling approach. And in particular, we're going to build a multivariate logistic regression. And the basic idea behind this kind of logistic regression model is that we'll have uh, our environmental variables, our environmental variable on the x. We'll have the probability that our species will occur on the right, so the probability of occurrence or the probability of presence will be on the y-axis. And then we're going to build a model that says at some environmental conditions the probability is very low, then there's some transition, and at some environmental conditions the probability of occurrence is very high. But we're going to do this for multiple variables at once. We can do this using the GLM function for building a generalized linear model. We'll go ahead and call this uh, logistic regression model since that's what we're building. And we'll say that's equal to GLM. And GLM is going to take three arguments. The first is the model that's going to be used. And so we want the present variable to be our response. That's related to, which we indicate with the tilde, uh, the minimum temperature, so our T min column, and the precipitation column. And we'll just model a non-interaction model here to keep things simple. The second argument is the link function or the family of model that we're building. And so we'll say family is equal to. And this is where we're going to specify that we're using a logistic regression. And we do that by saying it's the binomial family, parentheses, where the link function is equal to logit. And then the last argument that we need is the data to fit the model to. And so that is our hooded warb data. And we can take a quick look uh, at this resulting model by running summary on our logistic regression model. And if I slide over just a little bit, uh, we can see that we fit this GLM. Uh, there are uh, significant coefficients associated with both temperature and precipitation, and they're both positive, which makes sense because we saw a positive association over here when we visualized the data. So great, we've got a model. But as we've learned before in this class, we want to evaluate that model before we start to think about making predictions from it. And one of the most common ways to go about evaluating models for these kinds of binary classification problems, so we're trying to do a classification between presence and absence, so we've got two categories, it's a binary classification problem, is something called uh, receiver operating characteristic or rock curves. So let's look at what a rock curve is. A rock curve is a plot showing true positives against false positives. And so we're going to have uh, a line plot on two axes, and we're going to have false
positives on the x-axis. So that's cases where we predict that the species will be present, but it isn't. And then on the y-axis, we'll have true positives. And that's the good case where we predict that a species will be present and it is present. And then we use different thresholds on our predicted probability to say whether a species is predicted to be present or absent. So our model is going to say there's this probability that it's present and to figure out if we've got a true positive or a false positive, we have to pick the probability that we're going to say is the model saying this species will be there. So we could pick 50%, for example. If there's greater than a 50% chance that the species is present, then we'll say it should be present. And so then we can look at each location and using that 50% threshold decide whether we've got a true positive or a false positive. And then we can make a point on our graph. But we don't just use 50%, we also use other thresholds. And so, for example, if we picked a threshold close to zero, so if we said if the model has even a 10% probability that the species is present, then we'll call it present. Then we're going to get a high number for true positives because we'll almost never miss an actual presence, but we'll also get a high number for false positives because we'll end up saying that a bunch of things are present, are present when they aren't. And these axes are uh, labeled from zero at the origin to one, which is basically the total number of possible true positives and false positives at the edges. And so if we pick a low threshold like 10%, we'll get a number that's close to 100% of the pot possible true positives and 100% of the possible false positives. Likewise, we can pick really high thresholds. Let's say the model has to say there's a 90% probability of the species being present to count it as present. We're going to get lower true positives because we're going to miss a bunch of things that are actually present. But we're also going to get lower false positives because we're not going to be saying that things are present when they probably aren't going to be. And so we'll get numbers down here. And we can do this for 20 or 100 different thresholds and get a curve out. And that's called the ROC curve. And then we need to compare that to uh, the one-to-one -one line on this plot. And that one-to-one -one line is basically what we would get if our model was just randomly guessing as to where our species would occur and where it wouldn't. And so we really want our line to our curve, our rock curve, to be up above uh, this one-to-one -one line. Otherwise, we don't have a very good model. So that's the basic idea uh, behind ROC curves. To create our own ROC curve in R, we first need to split the data out between presences and absences. And so let's say presence underscore data is equal to, and I'm going to use dplyr again to filter the data. You can use subset or something else if you want. So I'm going to filter the our hooded warb data to only those values where present is equal to one. And then we'll also get our absence data in the same way 
by filtering the hooded warb data to be to the values where present is equal to zero. And once we have our presence and absence data split, we can then use the evaluate function from the Dismo package. And so I'll call the output from this evaluation. And we run the evaluate function. And it takes three arguments in this case, the presence data, the absence data, and then the model. And so we'll have presence data, absence data, and then our model, which is this logistic regression model. And this calculates information about model performance. And one of the things it lets us do is plot uh, the ROC curve using uh, an overloaded plot function. And so we can say plot evaluation comma, and then ROC in quotes. And so here we get out our ROC curve with the one-to-one -one line and a, a quantitative calculation of how much that curve deviates from the one-to-one -one line, which is called the area under the curve, or AUC. And in general, this curve looks pretty promising. We maintain really high true positive rates, even as the false positive rates drop off to about uh, 0 0.3. And so that's a, a fairly promising model. That being said, it's important to remember that these kinds of curves can be biased. They can look good when they aren't particularly good. Uh, when using absences from large scales, uh, which we've done here. Okay, so we've built our species distribution model. We've evaluated it, and at least at first glance, it looks like it's doing a reasonably good job. Now, how do we make predictions? And to make both spatial predictions for areas that haven't been sampled and forecasts from this model, we use the overloaded predict function from the raster package. And so we'll uh, call our spatial predictions. We'll start by making spatial predictions for the current time point. We'll call those predictions. And we'll generate those using the predict function. And the predict function is going to take three arguments. The first is the raster of environmental conditions uh, that we're going to make predictions for. And so that's ENV data current for us. The next argument is the model that we're going to use to make those predictions. So that's our logistic regression model. And then we want to add one optional argument here, which is type is equal to response. And that's going to have the information displayed uh, based on our response variable. It'll show us the probabilities, which is what we want to look at. And so then we can go ahead and plot these predictions if we want to. And since we've just actually made predictions at a global scale, we're going to zoom it in uh, to the portion of the United States where this species actually occurs. And so we'll say ext is equal to extent minus 140, minus 50, 25, and 60. And so this is basically just providing a range of longitudes and a range of latitudes to plot. And so uh, we can see that we've got a map of the probabilities of species presence. And so we can see there's high probabilities uh, down here in the southeast. Uh, they're not quite all the way over to the coast. And so that's our, our spatial prediction. 
and to get a feel for whether or not this is accomplishing the kinds of things that we want, let's now add our actual presence points to uh, this map to see if things line up. And we can do that uh, using the points function to add these as points to the map. Uh, we need just the location data again in the form of the data frame because this is working like its uh, spatial object. And so we can take our presence data and then using square brackets and a vector, we'll just get the longitude and the latitude. And we're going to add that. Uh, but let's go ahead and set our point type to plus using PCH and our size to 0 0.5 so that this will all visualize reasonably well. Uh, to let us actually see what's going on, uh, in my zoomed in teaching state, I'm going to run X11 down here to give us a new window. I'm actually going to expand it before I do anything else. Uh, and then I'm going to run these two lines again. And now what we can see is all of the recorded presences for the hooded warbler. Uh, and we can see that the model certainly predicts that they're likely to occur uh, in a lot of areas they occur in, but they predict pretty low probabilities of presence. The model predicts pretty low probabilities of presence in some areas where we know this species occurs. And that's because we have uh, lots of cases where the species is absent up here, as well as a few cases where the species is present at least in the environmental space that's being captured here. Now, so far, we've made maps of the model's probability of presence, and we've plotted that probability everywhere. But sometimes we only want to show the regions where we think a species is likely to exist. In order to do that, we need to define what it means to be likely to exist. And we do that by setting a threshold uh, above which we consider that probability to mean the species is likely to exist. And so one common choice would be 50%. If there's more than a 50% chance that the species is going to occur there, then will say uh, that it's likely to exist. And so to do that, we would do our same plot as above, where we would plot predictions, but we would only plot predictions that were greater than this threshold of 0 0.5. And then we'll also keep our extent limited uh, to the uh, contiguous United States. And so now what this will do is it will basically plot the sort of predicted species range, the locations where there is at least a 50% probability uh, that the species will be present. And we can use 50% as our threshold. It makes a lot of logical sense. But remember, it's only one of uh, the, these many thresholds that we looked at on our ROC curve. And some of those thresholds may actually be better for some circumstances than others. And so it depends on uh, what we value, where we really want those thresholds to be uh, for making these maps. And so, for example, we want, might want to make sure that all locations that a species could possibly occur at are included. Or we might want to make sure that our model predicts approximately the right number of presences 
compared to the data that we fit it to. And there's a function to help us choose this threshold called the threshold function. And so we can, we'll call this TR as short for threshold. And then we can run the threshold function. And the main argument for the threshold function is the output of evaluate. So for us, that's our evaluation object. And then we can optionally provide it an argument called stat, which will uh, select the threshold based on different requirements. And so we'll use uh, the prevalence function, which attempts to predict approximately the right number of presences, align the predicted and observed number of presences up effectively. And so if we do that, we can then run this same line as before. I'll just make a copy down here. But now instead of arbitrarily choosing a threshold, we'll choose one based on a threshold automatically determining the best one. And if we look now, uh, we've got something that looks quite a bit more realistic compared to the actual presences uh, that we saw before. And we can confirm that by again adding our presence data uh, points to this graph. And so now we've overextended the western boundary of the range a little bit. Uh, but we more accurately captured the distribution as a whole. So that's spatial predictions. And so then the last step that we need to take is to make actual forecasts. And making forecasts is exactly the same as making predictions except in order to make predictions about the future, we need to use environmental data that are forecasts for future environmental conditions. And so instead of making predictions with the current environmental data, we'll do it using the future data. And so we'll go ahead and call this forecasts. We'll run the predict function again. But now we're going to use env underscore data underscore forecast, because that's our environmental data for 50 years from now. We'll still use our same logistic regression model, because the assumption of this and most species distribution models is that the species response to the environment is the same now as it is in the future. And then we'll keep that type is equal to the word response in quotes. And then uh, we can now plot our forecasts and we'll keep exd is equal to extent minus 140, minus 50, 25, 60, so that we're still just looking at the area where the data was collected. And so we can see that our map has changed quite a bit. We used to have higher probabilities uh, in this area of the southeast. Uh, the higher probabilities have shifted towards the west. Uh, and also uh, this pocket uh, that's actually shifted over to the east. We can plot forecasts as a threshold like we have before if we want to. And so we could say forecasts greater than our fitted threshold, but keep our extent. And so we could get the same kind of where is it expected to occur. And we've got the same fairly large range, but it has contracted uh, here in the northeast, and now we've got this, this gap uh, in the southeast. 
And if we wanted to, we can sort of look at these side by side and, and get a feeling for what the changes are that have occurred. But we could also look at the predicted changes in probabilities over the next 50 years. And we could do that by plotting our forecasted probabilities, which are in forecasts, minus our current probabilities, which are in predictions. And then keeping our same extent. And so now we can see where we have positive and negative changes. In general, in this dense area of the range from before, we have decreases in the probability that the species will occur there. That makes sense. The environment is predicted to change. And so where it was good before will generally get less good uh, than it has been in the past. We see fairly large increases uh, in probability uh, to the north. That makes sense. Due to predicted increases in temperatures, these temperatures uh, 50 years from now will be similar to the temperatures uh, further south right now. Uh, we also see these increased probabilities off to the east. And this probably has something to do with either elevation and the temperature change or a shift in precipitation. So that's the basic idea behind species distribution modeling. We combine data on environmental factors with data on species occurrences. We build models relating those two factors to one another. We then can use those models to make predictions for where a species will occur or the probability of species occurrence uh, in areas where we haven't sampled for that species or in the future after environmental conditions have changed. We use that using the predict function and in order to make forecasts we provide the predict function predicted values, forecast values of the climate for the point in time in the future that we want to make forecasts for. All right, hopefully recording is working. Hopefully checking it won't mess up my sweet hair. Thanks to my stylist, I owe you everything. And so let's go ahead and are we okay? We're okay. Just a little lag. La la la. La 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 la. Okay, it's probably fine. Ah la 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 la. Ah.